Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Hello. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I raised my own volume like that. I started with a creepy whisper, and now we're at a real voice. Ladies and gentlemen. You're going to get fired from the show. You do a creepy whisper. <laughs> a creepy whisper gets me fired from the show. Oh, wow. It's that The climate's that bad? Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. It's just now now it's creepy whispers. You get fired from an episode. Just a show. creepy whisper? Yeah, it was it. more like a haunted. It wasn't like a yeah. sex creepy. Uh, it doesn't I'm matter now. Oh, yeah. Rosie's a <laughs> fan. Oh my God. All You're right. You're my witness. I'm a white male. <laughs> She's a minority lady, so I'm guilty. Um <laughs> Hey Rosie. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Comedy Film Nerds episode spoiler episode. Spoiler episode seven. Oh, the big seven O. Yeah, it's uh and the disaster artist. This is a movie we were looking forward to. We want, we're going to get all into it. And we've got a super fan with we've us. We've got a super, super. Su- <laughs> super fan. That's Rosie Tran, everybody. Um, real quick up top, if you're new to the spoiler app, so I know we have to do this every time, but we're going to talk about the entire movie, the ending, uh, key elements of the movie. So if you have not seen it and you don't want it ruined for you, press pause, go watch the movie and come back. Um, you might have to watch both movies for this one. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the reason we're doing the uh, the Disaster Artist spoiler app is Rosie texted me like a month ago and was like, Graham, I want to do a disaster artist spoiler rap. And I was like, uh, okay. Like, <laughs> I didn't think, usually we get somebody like, I want to talk about Thor, Ragnar, some big blockbuster. And it's Jackie. And it's Jackie Cage. Yeah. It's almost always Jackie. Um, so Rosie, you you do saw you... this come across your, your, your uh... computer and went, I'm in. I'm in. And okay, this is what happened. So I was at LA Podfest with supporting my friend uh, Yoshi. He was on one of your panels. You've and done, I, we had Out of the Box in the festival, I think two years ago? Yes. And um, so I was there supporting and watching, he, and you were prepping for Comedy Film Nerds, and you played the um, the trailer for The Disaster Artist. And I was like, Graham, what is that? And you're like, it's about the movie The Room. I was like, what are you talking about? And you're like, The Room. And I felt so stupid. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what he's talking about. So I went home, and my husband had also seen a weird, like, Disaster Artist Room video on Vox talking about how The Room is the greatest, worst movie of all time. And I was like, why don't we know what this is? So he surprised me and bought it online. And we watched. I literally had no idea what the movie was about. I knew nothing. Of you never was... remember those billboards on Highland Avenue. Where... I did, but I didn't put two and two together. Ah, okay. so I remember the billboards, the giant billboards. And, and let's I... back up. Where's the only place you could buy the DVD? On TommyWiseau.com or right. on the Amazon. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah. So I had no you and idea. You your husband are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no idea what I was getting into, and. I just knew a couple things. I heard worst movie of all time, you know, a couple things here and there. And the preview that I saw while I was watching you set up for comedy film nerds. I have to say it's in my top 10 movie, favorite movies of all time now. That's what everyone (laughs) says. Like it's one of those things. And at the beginning of the movie, they do this really cool thing. I thought they interview like, like Kevin Smith and other like famous. J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. All talking about. I mean, the, if you didn't know what they were talking about, you're like, oh, they're talking about The Godfather or something right. like that. Yeah. Like, the way they describe this movie, they're like, you could never make this movie if you tried to. Right. You could never mm-hmm. duplicate it. I, it. It was inadvertent lightning in a bottle. Yeah. I actually don't think it's a bad movie because afterwards I analyzed it. I like took a deep like inner soul journey and I was like, is this actually a bad movie? What is the purpose of a movie? To entertain? I was entertained. Right. To make, you know, it, it, to make me laugh. I laughed non-stop like I couldn't <laughs> stop I was giggling like a little schoolgirl on you know high on weed for the first time I was like this is so funny so I felt like it accomplished all of the things that movies are supposed to accomplish. I don't know if there's a, a modern comedy with a blockbuster star like Jim Carrey or Adam Sandler that I laughed as hard as right. I laughed at right. Tommy was so mm-hmm. <laughs> I know and it's it's true like okay so his intention was not to make a comedy. To make a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but guess what? Guess what? <laughs> I mean, it I think succeeds it, as it's one. funny. It's like, you, I remember the movie, the first Wes Anderson film, um, Bottle Rocket. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not as crazy of a story as The Room, but they it's were not. writing the script, Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson, and they're like, oh, these guys, and they're going to break into this thing, and they're going to steal 230 bucks or whatever, and they're on the <laughs> lam, and they were writing like a serious heist movie, and then they mm-hmm. went back and read 
initially and they just both started laughing they were like well this is ridiculous they wanted to be these like serious gritty filmmakers and they were like well this is preposterous and that's why bottle rocket is so hilarious and has so much heart to it is they were the initial intention was to be this like gritty dark this gritty yeah. Yeah. crime drama i mean these, <laughs> these guys with these dilemmas and these and all of those anderson films are comedies now like i can't imagine I, I don't think he's done a serious film right as far as drama serious drama is no. wes anderson yeah uh, well you know the thing the about his, comedy. The, the like, thing about he, he what he does is he mixes the two. So you've got really poignant moments, and that's true. You, you've that's also true. in like these quirky comedy films. Well, like Rushmore, or dark comedy, dark. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Rushmore right. has some like heart filled moments. Right. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? And so does the. I'm blanking on the name of it. The one that came out maybe four or five years ago about the kids in the summer camp. I'm blanking on the name. Something. Oh, oh Moonrise Kingdom. Oh, Moonrise Kingdom. Yeah. Yes. There's yeah. some like wow. That's an amazing script too. You know, when, when you just listen to every oh, single word. The scene where the boy yeah. is like, um, I think the girl feels slighted, and he's like, "I'm on your side." It's just this like, mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> like that's all anyone wants to hear. You know what I mean? There are a lot. There's like parental in, in some of his movies. There's like parental and there's like relationship and all sorts of you know. Like I I like um like I don't like all his movies like but even when I don't like a movie there's still interesting things in it like right. uh, like and sometimes I like the ones that other people didn't like as much <laughs> like uh, like the Darjeeling Limited the one like on the one. train yeah I really liked that one and that one like did not do well mm-hmm. at all. I think the last few didn't do well, but mm-hmm. he always has something very, very interesting. But, well, uh, let's do our ad read. Let's do our ad read. Let's, uh, before let's, we get into the yeah, before we get into dot com yes. and how they fulfill uh, orders. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Warby Parker. Warby Parker glasses, uh, a new concept in eyewear. Mm. And uh, you get a free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses, try them on for five days. There is no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid shipping label. So, uh, but here's the thing, War- Warby Parker, they, um, they're like a lot of these new companies where they wanted to kind of basically disrupt the industry with cheaper mm-hmm. glasses. They said, you know, glasses shouldn't cost as much as an iPhone. And, you know, they do. You go into a glasses store and they're really expensive. So um, they wanted to make glasses, buying glasses online easy and risk free. And but there's you know there are a lot of questions like well wait what what about the prescription how do I get right. that in there you know you can email it you can give them your doctor information they'll actually get contact the doctor for you if you want so there's different ways to actually get your prescription over there but they start at ninety five dollars that's a fantastic deal yeah and uh, all you have to do is go to warbyparker.com/slash/comedyfilmnerds to order your free home try on today that's warbyparker.com/slash/comedyfilmnerds free home try-ons today. It's a cool thing. They have a Warby Parker store actually on uh, Abbott Kinney in Venice Beach. Mm-hmm. So you could, like that that was cool to see it but then this if you're not close to a store they'll send you the stuff and this is the new trend and it's it's a good one of companies doing what Warby Parker's doing where you send it try it free shipping if you if it doesn't work for right. you, you know, mm-hmm. so you don't have to you can do it all in the And for every pair you buy a pair is dist- is distributed to someone in need. So they're also oh, they're a charitable nice. company too. That's awesome. So. So check him out, Warby Parker. All right. So now let's get into it. Oh, so Graham, I didn't answer your question. So after all of that, then I texted you and I said, Graham, I need to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> so after you, you and your husband watched it at home, you were like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I had so I had an extremely positive experience with the room. And I know we're here for the disaster artists, but then I had an extremely negative one. So I was so excited about it. I wanted to share it with my friends. So we have a couple friends that are like our best friends and we're like, they're going to love this. I invited them over. It was the most awkward hour and a half. They like seriously, like they're foreign. They're not from this country. I guess I didn't take into account that that and Neither affects, is Tommy. I know, but they- <laughs> he's from New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. Easy the bayou. He's from the he's bayou. from the bayou. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were like, what is this softcore porn that you're showing us? Like they had this horrified look on their face the entire hour and a half. And we were just sitting there on the couch looking at them and they looked horrified. <laughs> oh, that's awful. And was so they just Was like, it your parents? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Very funny. So they were just thought like, oh, Rosie and her husband just are some weird. This is like a weird think, swingers. Yeah, I think they yeah, like thought some we were... weird swinger video oh, that they're watching. No. <laughs> they're trying to get you in. It was. Do you guys want to try new things? Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Put because your keys if, in the bowl. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't realize, there's actually like four or five really long sex scenes, and it could it 
it was awkward. We were like, we're like, guys, it's a comedy. Like we were laughing and they just had this look of horror on their face the entire time. I was like, oh. And you haven't heard from them since, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're just like. We've heard from them, but they, they definitely looked shocked and horrified. <laughs> <laughs> what was there like the next day where they're just like, wow, dinner was great. Like they just <laughs> never mentioned the movie. I mentioned, I said, hey guys, you know, it's really, it's absurd comedy. Like, I'm sorry if you guys, did. they're like, oh, it was okay. Like you yeah. could just tell they were just horrified. Mm -hmm. God, you, that's when you go, I wish I could have heard the car ride home. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Just like, what is Rosie and their husband doing? Yeah. What are they doing? Well, I thought you they had, were our friends. I know. The, this sex is so are, <laughs> the sex scenes are so long. Like if you, Tommy really wanted <laughs> oh, <laughs> to show that cheddar, you know, that cottage cheese butt of his. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, disaster runner. Sorry, I, um, I digress. <laughs> no, it's all, it's, all, it's all relatable. So then- T tell us, because you went to, didn't you go to a, a special screening where he spoke or something I like did. that? I, I did. I did a crazy disaster artist uh, room weekend. So Saturday night, I went to the midnight screening at Landmark. He showed up. Um, he kind of looked a little Michael Jackson-esque, actually. He had the full pale makeup on. And um, he spoke. He said thanks to everyone. He did a and a Pretty much everyone tried to ask him the four questions that he refuses to answer. Where are you from? How old are you? How right. old are you? A couple of people asked him how his sex life was. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He said, oh, wonderful. I have sex every single day, every minute, every hour. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was a total Tommy answer. Oh, Tommy, so, you're 75. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they asked him where, he, you know, he's, how old he was. He said, who cares? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he was he was awesome. He's he's a funny guy by accident. Oh yeah, right. that's right. and I think <laughs> in, in getting into the movie now, like I think that's the thing that James Franco did such a fantastic job. He of. channeled him. He channeled. It was yeah. great. He mm -hmm. was great. And Tommy at the screening said he actually um, totally supports the movie, and he said it's not it's accurate. Like, we asked him. We said, "Is it an accurate portrayal of you?" And he said, "Ninety nine point nine percent accurate." And we're like, "Well, what's accurate?" And he just said he didn't like the way James Franco threw the football. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. But he said it was ninety nine point nine percent accurate, and and he has said that Wait. the book, The Disaster Artist, is not. He said it's only forty percent accurate. So I don't know. Really? If him, yeah, him and Greg Sistro got into a huge fight after Greg wrote the book, and they are, their friendship broke up, and they were not on speaking terms. And Greg was the oh. Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. but they uh, they have since uh, they've reconciled. Reconciled, right? They've since reconciled, but. Mm. Yeah, so he he said, you know, book only 40% accurate, but he said that the film was 99.9% .9 accurate. Wow, which is not true for any biopic. <laughs> no, no, that's the best percentage yeah, that's yeah, ever yeah, happened yeah. in any biopic ever. Uh, well, that's the thing that was so amazing to me, and I, and I was like, James Franco and w his producing partner, Vince Jolivet, uh, actually knew both of them. I, I studied with them at Playhouse West mm -hmm. in the Valley. And to see what James Franco did here was you're playing a guy that is being hilarious that doesn't know it. Right. He's not trying to be funny. He's just, yeah. <laughs> He's just so out there. He's, He's a character that, that looks like somebody wrote. Exactly. It's like yeah. this is if you, if you didn't know this, you would it, think he wasn't real, like not right. a real person. Like, right. If you, right. Don't you, talk <laughs> about my money or my car. Right. You know, like things like like that. Like what? You'd be like what? bullshit. Yeah. In this day and age, mm -hmm. everyone would know who he is. Like, come mm -hmm. on. Like you wouldn't believe. Don't dog would, about me. You wouldn't <laughs> believe it. But then you see this movie, and again, the best worst movies are always made by people who are so sincere. Have like, passion. They have such a passion, and they just don't understand how movies are made at all. Right, and it doesn't stop them. It doesn't <laughs> stop them at all. It's like you watch that movie, I think it was, was it Miami Ninjas? <laughs> Where it's this Taekwondo studio in the 80s or 90s. Um, it's the Miami Connection. The Miami Connection, right. It's the Miami, <laughs> Miami Ninjas sounds better, I think. It's, it's, yeah, that would have been a good rewrite. <laughs> Miami Connection is another movie that's like, wow. And who and you find out who made it. It was this Taekwondo studio that were like, we should make a movie. <laughs> no plot, <laughs> nothing making sense. You know what I mean? People just show up for no reason, and then it's right. like a fight scene has to happen. It's just they're like, they just wanted to show off their moves. All right, right now I have to watch, watch Taekwondo Connection or whatever. The Taekwondo <laughs> Connection. <laughs> what Miami That's Connection? That's the prequel. <laughs> every, um, every single title so far is better than the actual yeah. title that has been mentioned. <laughs> Miami Connection is. And again, it's that same thing. You knew at the time they were like, yeah, like we're doing <laughs> something here. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the sincerity and the craziness. I 
love it. Look, I haven't made a movie. I haven't written, directed, acted, and starred in a movie. So I, I know so many people make fun of him and say he's, you know, whatever. He's crazy. He's a quirky character. And I know you guys aren't. You guys are being so light about it. But some people are like, oh, it's the worst movie of all time. He sucks. He's horrible. He's an idiot. I haven't made and directed a movie and acted and starred and written in one. I don't know if I made one if it would turn out well, worse. Than now, me. to be fair, do you have a uh, small fortune sitting in a bank account that you could just a miscellaneous <laughs> small fortune yeah, that yeah, nobody yeah. Knows. nobody knows where the money comes from? Yeah, or how much is in there? I mean, there's one scene with Seth Rogen where, and this, by the way, this would never happen. As a, oh yeah, uh, the, the bank, bank teller, teller goes, yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> this account's a bottomless pit or whatever. That's he says. confidential like, information. Yeah, you you're not never, sharing bank information yeah, you don't with share. a stranger. I person. think it would. I wouldn't be surprised if it did actually happen that way. Yeah. Ninety nine percent accurate, guys. Because the world is, you know, it is it is crazy, mm-hmm. and but Tommy Wiseau's crazy. The Tommy fact Wiseau's, that he made a film. Tommy Wiseau's crazy. So why wouldn't a bank guy just be like? Everyone at the bank would just be like, "This guy, this well, what the fuck with this guy?" Now for real, like, come on. And you really like when you watch what like the sequence of events, you go, "Well, that can't have happened," and it did. It did. Like like oh well, we don't rent equipment. No, we want to buy everything, and we want to buy both a film and a digital camera and shoot. <laughs> On both at the same time. I mean, uh, but here's the most surprising thing. Like, even with all those things, I'm like, well, they still probably couldn't have spent that much money on this movie. I mean, uh, when you look at like what, what, yeah, when (laughs) when you look at what showed up, uh, you know, as the final product, six million dollars. Well, the thing that I loved about the movie, so they they did such a great, they'd say like, uh, shooting day one of forty, right. And then it was like 50 of 40. Yeah, it was like yeah. 52 of 40, yeah. 58 of 40. We went over budget. <laughs> and you and the thing I loved about it was why I I believe it to be true and hearing that Tommy said that at your screening that you went to Rosie that it was 99.9% accurate. We've all been on shoots where the people in charge didn't know what the fuck they were doing. <laughs> right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it is a cluster. Everyone thinks they can make a movie and they can't. Right. And it is a clusterfuck and so you go, "Oh, I see why this these guys who don't know what they're doing walk to the studio and they're like, do you want to rent the equipment or do you want to buy it? Well, we want to buy. And it's like, and then the two, Hannibal Burris and I forget the other comic who played the, the two guys. Oh, Gerald Carmichael. Gerald Carmichael. Uh, yeah. Um, who played the- uh, The other actor or something like that. The, the, well, no, the two guys- The owners that, of the uh, uh, oh, I don't know equipment the house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, so it was uh, Hannibal Burris and this other comic and they're the, they own the equipment house and the soundstage. And when they have this quick conversation, they're like, do they have the, if he has the money, <laughs> if he has we'll the be, money, yeah, he has the money. All right, and they're like, sure, you can buy. And it's like, we want to buy, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was amazing. And then the, again, this the Seth Rogen scene where he goes to the bank, where he's just like, <laughs> he's done that thing that we've all done. Is this gonna clear? And I don't think this check mm-hmm. is yes. gonna clear. Mm-hmm. But all right, mm-hmm. and because that's crazy show business. And when the guy clears, he was like, what? So not yeah. to toot my own horn, but I was in a movie. Um, with little people and also um so who's the basketball player that is friends with Kim Jong un? Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. With Dennis Rodman. And that happened to me and my check did not clear. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. So my that's... Dennis Rodman movie check did not clear, but Tommy Wiseau's checks cleared. So. Yeah, they did. <laughs> and that's why I be- that's why I, I maybe I just want to believe that that bank scene is true because yeah. I believe the guy goes in there and says, wow, I didn't think this was going to clear yeah. at all. And the teller just goes, oh, no, man. Yeah. Six million dollars. Six. That, the, so that means that he's worth more than six million. Of course. Because, that was so just he's got to be like film. 20, 30 million if that, because he just threw it like a like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. in the hat, right? Here, oh, he's got to be worth, I mean, even more. Or there must be a steady stream coming in. Like, is it drug money from the <laughs> Russian mob? Or like what? <laughs> New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. The New Orleans mafia. Does, does he own Warsaw in Poland yeah, yeah. or something? <laughs> yet? Uh, he's here, an eccentric here, millionaire. Here's the other thing I found out. Um, you know that billboard on, How, uh, on Highland mm-hmm. uh, Avenue? Five thousand dollars a week. Really? Five thousand dollars a week. It was up for years. It was up for years. years. Yeah. I never knew what it was. I would see it and I was like, "What is that?" That's two hundred and fifty yeah. grand a year. Yeah, yeah, just for the billboard for, the for a billboard. movie that wasn't showing anywhere. <laughs> like, because it would I think only do. Show one, yeah, one it would only the do cost of earbuds. It would only do special <laughs> screenings. Yeah, like like it would do the special screenings, and then uh, but then the billboard never went away. It was there, well, you know, for years. To be fair, to defend the Tommy. Because By the I, way, uh, it it worked though. 
You know, <laughs> well, that's the thing. That, I mean, th- that's the point. And Ro- the, the point that you made, Rosie, is like we can sit there. Oh, he doesn't know what he's doing, but it worked. It, it worked. worked. It doesn't matter. It, right. it, not just that, but okay. W- so will it ever work again? <laughs> no. 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 no, no, no. <laughs> ever. Ever. He'll never be able to do this yeah. again. No one will. I, this I, is it. This I is a do, once in a once in a lifetime one okay, person. So thing. I do want to defend the Tommy though, because one of the criticisms of the film is that many, many scenes, maybe. I would. I'm making a random guess. Maybe about forty percent of the scenes are out of focus. Okay, so that's one of the uh, the complaints about him. But he did pay and hire a professional cast and, and crew. So shouldn't the crew, who was an equipment owning crew, a production company, is that Tommy's fault? No, no, no. That, the no ca- it's the camera actually, operator's yeah. fault. If the camera operator wouldn't focus the thing. Well, now this could have to do with. Uh, now I'm just speculating here. <laughs> is that. Uh, when they chose to shoot on both film and on digital, they both need to be lit differently. <laughs> so if one was lit for one and it was being recorded on the other camera, <laughs> there yes. might have been a focus issue. That's <laughs> true. That's true, Chris. <laughs> I, well, so, so let's get into the details. The I'm details the of the film. Artist. Overall, yes. I, I obviously, I really like this movie. It got a it little... It was fun. It, it was, was a fun It was movie. a blast. Was really fun, yeah. mm-hmm. I was in an audience that was mostly the college age kids that go to these midnight screenings because one of them is in Westwood, you know? Right. Um, and everyone was laughing and having a blast. And uh, where it slowed down a little bit for me is when the, and again, I'm nitpicking here. I'm nitpicking. The movie's a blast. If you haven't seen it, you don't have to know anything about the room. It's a blast. Although it helps. I it think it d- helps It definitely a lot. helps. It yeah, definitely I think helps. It helps a lot. And I think it's such an L.A. thing. Because the like, and they even they even he waves at this isn't the actual Angeline, but there's a woman in a pink car that just waves right. at him, and that's 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 such a when you first moved to L.A. There's I this thought I was going to see Dennis yeah, yeah. Woodruff's car. Yeah, I yeah, know we didn't see that. They should have put Dennis Woodruff's <laughs> car in there, but literally that billboard, Angeline, and actor Dennis Woodruff were such a thing. If you moved here in like the late '90s, or right. '90s Angeline's or two, early, still around. I, I seen know. her on the freeway. I saw her on the 101, like maybe within the last year. Still in the pink Corvette. Pink Corvette. Mm-hmm. I, I saw her one time in person. She looks a lot more haggard, though. No. <laughs> well, how old is she? Is she older than Tommy? Oh, she's think? gotta be older than Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she's gotta be. I'm what, surprised 70? Tommy didn't put her in the movie. In the room, the original right. the room. Mm-hmm. She seems like a perfect the room character. I want to cast a real actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, so so the one scene where it did slow down is when Mark moves out and they sort of have their breakup. Right. A little bit. I was like, okay. And, but maybe that, I don't know, because it almost seemed like so Tommy's in love with him or something. That's the thing I did not get because I felt like there was a sexual vibe that Tommy had on him, but they never, uh, or Mark, Mark, um, Greg Siestra's character, but I never, I, I don't. I don't think he's gay. I, I think what I think what it, that scene was trying to portray is that uh, Tommy doesn't have a lot of friends. He felt betrayed, right? Yeah, yeah. and he Betrayal. had the one friend that he had was moving out, and now and this is the one that he brought down from San Francisco with him. So he felt betrayed, like uh, like that he was picking the girl over him. So right. I think that's that's kind of what they were they were trying to show in that scene. Um, I want to know if people were really laughing at the first movie premiere oh they had to have they been. had to have been yeah. i think i think especially if you're sh- I, th- I would love to talk to someone that was actually at that one but i find that you're in la everyone here works in the entertainment industry in some capacity you know what i mean yeah. like i think this this audience the, the la audience is way more film savvy than than right. most just because the premieres are here you know somebody even well, if yeah. you don't work in show business you know even somebody. if you're like an accountant right. or something you yes. have at least 10 friends that are in you the yes. and, they, and you've gone to some free screenings <laughs> right. and, yeah. and I, i'll tell you it's uh you know the franco brothers they really look like these characters too mm-hmm. like they really look like the real people like he looked like greg he looked like tommy that like you could tell time was spent into um, not only setting up like the world, like what you're saying, like everyone's in the business and you know everyone's in Hollywood talking about the industry or whatever, but uh, there was a, a lot of attention to detail in this movie, which I really liked. I noticed that too, yeah. From everything from you know the recreation of the scenes to what the um, the main characters actually looked like, even from like you know all the weird. <laughs> chains and belts that uh, you know that that Tommy would wear. That uh, hashtag true. He was wearing two very large belts yep. when I met him. That that, that James Franco, <laughs> you know, he was wearing, 
and like all that was recreated. Like uh, so, you could tell this was a passion project for for uh, James Franco. Yeah, and 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 for all the right reasons, because sometimes mm-hmm. a big celebrity goes, "Oh, I want to," you know, and their their passion for it is just. This was a fun passion project. Oh, it was great. He, yeah. he, obviously, he's like anyone who saw the movie, saw the room, and went, "Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> who the fuck? how do we? Let's make a story about this dude." And then when the book came out, I'm sure he was like, "Okay, buy the rights to the book. Let's make, right. let's do this." He's mentioned in the book too, uh, uh, James Franco. I think. Yes, Tommy says he would only have two people ever play him: Johnny Depp or James Franco. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is before they bought the rights and they were planning. He just said it. Right. Like at a screening or an interview or something. He said, I'll only allow two people to play me. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> These two really good looking actors is who he <laughs> picks. Fantastic. Fantastic, Tommy. And, and James Franco even stayed in character as Tommy was out in between shots while directing the film. So, But I can see that. I could totally see I that. think you kind of have to. I and feel like it would be hard to go back and forth. You right. could, because it's not just like sort of, oh, get in this emotional state. You're done. And, and I think... You you couldn't flip back and forth between that specific speech like pattern. accent yeah yeah, yeah that yeah. accent weird mumbly oh hi Mark oh hi Mark <laughs> yeah I want to be a movie mm-hmm. you know like you couldn't just then at lunch be talking regular no. but let's, but that's the the thing that was so amazing too about the stinger at the end credits where there's a party scene and the real Tommy comes up and interacts with James Franco as Tommy in the stinger at the end of the movie that was. That alone is worth <laughs> watching the entire film for because he's just like, who is this guy? Who are you? And they're both talking to each other. And it's just like, and you, I give props to, to James Franco's acting. He wasn't doing like mimicry or an impression. No, he channeled. He was channeling, yeah. 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 I liked before the credits when they compared the original room scene to the James to the Franco recreation. That was so yeah. cool. That was yeah. because then it, that also too made the disaster artist that much more impressive because you saw they went to great care. They didn't give their interpretation. They said they reshot t- pretty much 20 minutes of the original yes. film. 20 yeah. minutes. They, they d- reshot that and movie. And <laughs> we're, I mean, the same physicality, yeah. the same. It was a couple things were off, but yeah, it was like 90%, 90 percent, yeah. 90 plus percent, like perfect. But it was just like, yeah, the wardrobe and then the original actors that were cast, you're just like, Wow. <laughs> The, the girl that plays Lisa is a stand-up, but I've never met her. No, really? I Googled her, and I saw a bunch of stand-up clips online, and she had performed at a couple places that I've, uh, like some bar shows and stuff that I've been to, and I was like, oh, my God, I need to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> I need to meet her. <laughs> I wanted to say, um, too, so then... I want to know what it's like to like have Tommy was so on top of you and have to reshoot that like nine thousand times. I know. Because, you know there was like so many reshoots. I know, and they're like, is she? Is he having sex with her belly button? Does, yeah. does he know where her <laughs> vagina is? Like, god damn, that was fun. <laughs> Seth Rogen and um, Paul Shear, their their characters, I thought played. Paul Shear did a great job of playing like. A crew guy that's fed up, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that's probably which is all of them. All of them, <laughs> just fed up, just enough. It, that's so true. I never thought of that till you said that, but it's true. Yeah, yeah. just like what is this guy doing? What's going mm-hmm. on? I mean, even the small scenes, like with with showing the whole crew, Charlene Yi. <laughs> So funny. Can we take a picture of continuity? Ah, it's in my head. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's just staring at Continuity, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to have all these people who are like, well, this is how you make a movie. We always do this. And then to have the head person be like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're all just bewildered. It's, like, f- it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We do it this way. The scene where... My favorite scene in The Disaster Artist and in The Room is the same scene, and that's the same scene with Chris R., who is uh, the drug the, dealer. The drug dealer. Oh, played by Zach Efron. Is played mm-hmm. by Zach Efron. That is my absolute favorite scene because when I was watching the original of The Room, it's such a jarring scene because you're like watching this like softcore porn, and then all of a sudden he's just like screaming, like, Give me the fucking money! Give me that! You're like, Whoa, what, what happens? Like, what genre is this film? <laughs> I remember sitting on my couch at home and literally leaping back almost an inch in my seat because I was like, What, like, what genre is this? <laughs> I was like, I thought this was like a romance. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> well, that's what I loved about it is then it you're you're seeing the behind the scenes. So the the Chris Ark or Zach Efron is like 
all right, he got hired to play this character. This actor's like, I'm showing up. I'm bringing it. You want me to be the criminal? So you see they're like tweaking the lights and doing all that stuff. And then he's like fucking getting himself yeah. fucking ready. And you're just like, oh, this is rad. It was a great role for Zac Efron, too. It's great. It like, yeah, it was perfect for him. Because like I remember I've watched um, in that uh, a Stanley Kubrick documentary, they show Jack Nicholson on the set of... Um, the Shining, mm-hmm. and they're tweaking the lights and everything. And he's it's like this, getting ready. Yeah, and there's a scene where he <laughs> where he's gonna come in the doorway and go, "Here's Johnny," where he's like nuts chasing his wife. So you see Jack Nicholson. So the Shining. The Shining. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. I thought I said one flew over the cuckoo's nest. No, you're nuts. I said the shining. <laughs> he definitely did not say that, Chris. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you can tro- I can see how you could totally mix up the shining and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah, that's they what sound I heard. alike. Yeah, they did. They sound yeah. exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> you said the shining. I thought you said transformer. Yes. <laughs> that would actually make more sense than one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So no, Chris. That's the- what I was thinking in my head. I was like, oh, he's getting ready for it, and then and the, the chief is gonna break the window. Go ahead. <laughs> So no, Chris, that's not that's not what was going on. Apparently, that was what was going on in your brain. Yeah, what was going He's on? Like Tommy was so. I it's things just go off. Going, yeah, that's what came into my head. I don't know what's going on out here. Continuity? What are you talking about? Yeah, we don't need a picture. <laughs> so yes, for The Shining. Yeah, uh, Chris. Yeah, so you see Jack Nicholson, and and you see like he's prepping, prepping, and you see like camera guys like get out of his way. You know what I mean? Because Jack Nicholson is just going. He's, he's method. He's method. He's getting mm. nuts. And you see, and so that's <laughs> happening on in the Disaster Artist. Showing that was, I was like, it was such a cool. It is sort of behind the scenes on how movies are made, but then specifically this movie and how a bad movie, like people who aren't in the entertainment industry, are like, God, how did they make this? How does this happen? Now, the room is obviously a, a very extreme example, but you see the little pieces. That if they aren't put together correctly, you have a mess. You hey, have a mess. I mean, mm-hmm. movie making is hard business. I've been on sets before where it's the collaborative sc- effort. The co- yeah, the script supervisors and paying attention, the sets, and then you you know the final thing, and it's only something that maybe somebody that worked on the film would notice. But you know, maybe we're at dinner and there's a a, a cup there, and we accidentally move the cup, but they have right. to use that shot because that's the shot we got. Yeah, and it just looks really bad. Mm-hmm. So. On um, this, obviously, I don't know if Tommy purposely wanted to look bad, or I personally think he's an accidental creative genius. I mean, he's a genius to me. I was entertained every single time I watch. I've watched it now three or four times. I'm entertained. Disaster Artist, I was completely entertained by who he was as a person. I don't know if I want to hang out with him and be like best buds. <laughs> and name, name a movie other than Rocky Horror Picture Show that whatever... 13, 14 years later is still standing room only. Yeah, you know, it's still out. sold out. Has screenings. that cult following? Uh, where? Yeah. Uh, how many movies are doing that? And are now then get it. and then get a movie made about it. Yeah. And refuse distribution and only sell it on your website. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's ma- like no one else has done. Tommy this. wants his profits. Okay, he needs yeah. to make back six million dollars. Right. <laughs> Which he has. I'm sure he I think will. He, yeah, and I think and now him. this disaster artist film. The room, there's the room screenings are going to be fucking sold out. Right, like this is going to yeah. up his ticket sales and his. Good and, for him. I haven't done something like I, I said. Know. I haven't done something like that. I know. I him. wish I could do a movie <laughs> from 13 years ago. I did a movie 13, 14 years ago. There's not standing room only people to watch Hello Junkie. You know what I mean? <laughs> they might watch a clip of it on my YouTube channel, but there's no way it's this. Well, it, this is the kind of thing too, where you know they and at the end of the movie you see that. Uh, him and Greg are still making movies. Like yeah. they're still putting, but you know they have a movie coming out in a couple months. Best yeah. friends. But it's the kind of thing where <laughs> fantastic. You know, it's, it looks horrible. But no, it's it's, it's no, never. Rosie. You how know, can you, how could it look? It looks actually horrible though. Like it doesn't. It's it's not the room. No, and it, nothing ever will be. No matter how they could make a hundred movies after the room, they could even and take the same cast and crew, and they probably couldn't make the room. You could yeah. sit there and actively go, "Let's make the craziest, dumbest movie with no continuity and no," and it wouldn't be, it the, wouldn't room. be the room, and it still wouldn't be the room. You couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You couldn't duplicate this ever again. That's why it mm-hmm. is so amazing. Uh, like, yeah. And by the uh, way, I had uh, so I actually wanted to comment on something. We got on a tangent. So you were talking about the detail. 
Mm-hmm. If there was so much detail, and I I guarantee they put it on purpose, the scene where they come up to L.A. into uh, Tommy's pied de terre apartment complex, they open the door. There's a stack of old mail there. There's like you know when they're in his apartment in San Francisco. There's all these knickknacky travel items and knickknacky items. I guarantee you, uh, James Franco went and and talked to Tommy and looked. I mean, Tommy's on set and a lot of the behind the scenes footage and stuff like that too. So oh, wow. I think they really like went all out, like every detail. I think so. I yeah. absolutely, it absolutely. It felt, felt that way. I mean, yeah. And the scene where him and Mark are leaving, and he's picking Mark up, and his Mark's mom is like, "Who is this guy?" I know. Right? She's like, "What do you want with my son?" <laughs> yeah. She's like, "What do you want with my son?" And mm. he, and he's like, "You're the same age as my son. You're 19." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm 19. <laughs> oh, I'm 14. <laughs> oh, you look good. <laughs> 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 This is craziness. Mm-hmm. It was, I, I can't. Um, he has a YouTube series, I think, Ask Tommy, if you guys want to ever, uh, in, just you're bored and you want to enjoy life. <laughs> and it's just asking him like questions about the universe and him giving his little Tommyisms, And they're pretty freaking funny. Oh, that's great. That's so fantastic. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you got to keep the brand going. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the thing about a guy like this is he's, how you know, this guy is once in a in a million. Like, there's no yeah, who there's else. No Tommy Wiseau. How well you're gonna ever meet somebody like this? He's not like anyone you've ever met. Mm-mm. So how? I mean, yeah, it's, it's like the <laughs> fucking yeah. man from Mars or something. It's like uh, he's Ed Wood meets Tyler Perry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get yeah, cuz me, he meets, funds his own movies, yeah. has his own studio, <laughs> distributes them and uh just uh, and can't make one. Cult following, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cult following. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and his fucking shit nuts, right. you know. <laughs> but God bless him and God bless his film and and um, you know, kudos to James Franco for for putting this together, yeah. And yeah. everyone involved in it. It's just mm-hmm. like you're a part of a magical thing. Yeah. Looks ugh. So uh, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> it, it's definitely a good time at the movies. I will say this: ArcLight kind of gouged a little bit, um, you know, because it was a limited screening, mm-hmm. and uh, so that means like it's you're getting it a week early, so they up the ticket prices a little bit. It's seventeen dollars for a matinee. Oh wow! I so. saw it at uh, the AMC in Century City. Yeah, still like fifteen bucks, I think. Mm-hmm. Sixteen yeah. bucks. Or whatever. I went to the ArcLight too. We might have been at the same one. <laughs> yeah, probably the one in Hollywood because it wasn't playing in the. In the no, valley. no, I mean the same showing. Oh, could be. <laughs> <laughs> I was the one cackling in the back. <laughs> yeah, there were. Yeah, people were loving the movie. Uh, people, yeah. I mean, th- I haven't, and I was laughing. You know, we've talked about, and you said this at the top of the show too. Is like, especially as comedians, we're we're way too judgmental mental about a, a comedy yeah. like this movie's a comedy so we're be like okay i get that joke that's right. cool or whatever but this movie i was i was fucking howling man because it's I all character driven that's what i was gonna too. say the reason i think it's kind of hard to be judgment super judgmental about it is because i think as comics a lot of times we're looking at the jokes but the, these are not set up punchline jokes these are not written jokes this is just tommy right right what's funny mm-hmm. about it is not it's not like Tommy's like saying jokes or, you know, no. I, I watch, you know, certain comedies and I'm like, really, that's the punchline or I'll watch him and I'll, and, and I'll judge it that way as a comedian. But there's no comedic writing in this because it's not you're not writing a joke. You're, it's, he's just being himself. Yeah, this is right. that's this, what the comedy. Yeah, yeah I know. I know, it's, <laughs> I know. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's why it was so great. So it's like you can't even judge it like a comic because it's like you said, it, it's the man from Mars. It's another dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Us. Just his, you know, his acting performance at the beginning. Stella. Like, oh, so funny. And like and, and like no one in the acting school wants to do a scene with him. Right. And it's his acting like, teacher's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. He's like, what are you doing? Except Mark wants to have an acting he's scene. He's like, oh, I really liked your intensity. I mean, your intensity is <laughs> really awesome. And he's like, why do you want to be with me? Mm-hmm. Why do you want to come follow around? Or whatever? Mm-hmm. And just like, it's, you want to do a scene with me? Yeah. And he gets, okay. he gets him to do book and say that crazy shit in the restaurant. Yeah. Like only Wingbird actors would be right. like, yeah, man, you got to be real. It's mm-hmm. funny that you said that because I was thinking that whole time about Greg Siestro's or, or you know, Mark or whatever. I was like, I know guys from acting class like that. They're like, yeah, you got to be method intense. And <laughs> I did that. I was working on a scene um, from... Uh, what is it? This Transformers. This Transformers. <laughs> no, Chris, one I was flew gonna, the uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, it's a scene where Billy kills himself. It's yeah, fun. Yeah. Scene. <laughs> I did it at a Chipotle. Uh, no, that scene. I believe the soldier. And um, so we, there's this scene. Um, 
between I play the white officer, obviously, and you're white. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's weird. White guy, Graham Elwood. Who would think that that Angloey, <laughs> that Angloey name would be white? Um, but uh, they made it into a movie um, with Denzel Washington, and but it's about it's it's a uh, an officer was killed in the '40s, and when they were first starting to integrate the army for World War II, so it's this it's this. Uh, it's this war, uh, war and race issue thing. So I was playing the white officer, and I'm talking to the. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up. What right. was the name of? It? I'm gonna look. He up. doesn't know. Oh. <laughs> He's googling it. <laughs> uh, the soldier. Yes, 1982. Um, so this was. Uh, no, this is not it. <laughs> I no. told you. U- Universal Soldier. No. Is that <laughs> soldier story? Maybe a soldier story. This is it. Um. Yeah, so it was directed by Norman Jewison. It's uh, blaze, based on the Charles Fuller play. Okay. It had Howard E. Rollins Jr., Adolf Caesar, and um, ooh, someone's named Adolf. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> he, and he's a fantastic actor. So this movie, it was a, it was a Broadway play that they made into a, a movie, and it's it's I highly recommend it. And so they're investigating this um, this black man was killed, uh, this black uh, sergeant. And they, they're on a base that is segregated. So there's a the the black soldiers are on part of the base, and the white soldiers, and they're getting ready. This is this is how it actually was done, you know. And th- they sent black uh, units to fight in World War II because they didn't want to integrate right the military. So this guy's killed, and Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's so this guy's killed, and then and then they hi- there's a a new. A uh, black officer that's investigating it, and so he's got to interview a lot of Southern redneck soldiers, and so it's this whole thing about race and the South and everything. Um, it can't be an easy job. <laughs> it's, it's it's not an easy job. So so it's this really good play. So uh, me and the, my mm-hmm. uh, a buddy from my acting class, we're we're working on this scene, and there's this mm-hmm. there's this powerful scene where um, they're arguing. You know, that's a, a white. We're the same rank. It's really well written. We're both captains. And I'm not a full-on racist. My character's not a full-on racist, but I'm a white guy in the 40s and the military in the South, so I have some skewed ideas. And so there's a scene, and and we were this, in, we were rehearsing it in class, and the teacher's like, you guys are too big. You're too yelly. It, it needs to be a little more reserved. So he said, go do this scene out in public. And, like, the N-word's being thrown around in the script <laughs> and all this stuff, and we're just like... Well, I'm like, <laughs> all right, man, you know, and so we, we, you know, we're, we're in a, a Paquito Moss, but it actually was, it, in for the, for this purposes, it was, it was good for the scene because then we learned how to be we, intense, but not as loud. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Be intense know, in a public place. <laughs> yeah. Because the, I mean, that's, you know, as a young actor and on a stage actor, you just make everything big and loud and on film, it's, it's like. It's known as the taquito technique. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Created yes. by Graham Elwood. This is my taquito <laughs> acting technique, guys. Um, and really good salsa. Yeah. <laughs> but so anyway, but that I re- like watching that scene of these two young actors like do that. I was like, oh, God. one young actor. One young actor. <laughs> Sorry, Tommy. <laughs> yeah. and, and James Frank, who's my age. Um, and I'm 32. I yeah. meant uh, he was playing Tommy, who was supposed to be a lot older. Yeah. Mm-hmm. James Frank was my age. I'm 48. He's around there. He's right in that wheelhouse. Right. But he's not 19. But he's not. 19. Which is what Greg Siestra was playing a 19 year old. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was. It was uh, that reminded what me. What do you want with my son? Anyway, what else? Anything else to? I think we covered this uh, movie. Rosie, final Both thoughts. Movies. Since this, since uh, since October, your life has been changed. You saw because of you, actually, Graham. Because <laughs> of you playing the trailer at LA Podfest, my life has been changed. I had to take. Uh, one of my favorite out of the top ten and put the room up there and maybe disaster artist. What got bumped? I'm not sure yet, but I know. over the cuckoo's nest? <laughs> <laughs> Did Chris just say The Shining? <laughs> I thought I heard him say The Shining. So, so you gained a movie and lost a couple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of ups and downs since yeah. Podfest. A lot of ups and downs. Since, uh, if you guys could have seen their horrified faces, I, I mean, I it was like... I, I we started watching it and I thought, okay, you know, they're a little uncomfortable. There this there is like an opening 
sex scene and a threesome scene oh. with Denny. A little awkward, right? I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. I'm being patient. You and your husband should have started making out or something <laughs> weird. You put your but, hand on her okay, leg. Or... Let me just say, I love my friends. They're they're two of my best friends in the whole world. But if you do not laugh at cheep, 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 cheep. Right. Mm-hmm. There's something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I did not do it. I did not do it. Cheep, 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 yeah. cheep, 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 cheep. <laughs> it's the most insane scene. He wrote it into the script. He wrote the words cheap, cheap, cheap into the script. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> when would in your mind would the words cheap, cheap, cheap ever be like, this is going to be such good dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> Comedic genius. That's all I have to say. And then the football scene in the alley, and then at the, during the credits when they showed the original, se- the, uh, it's. The- and, the, and then that other random couple that had sex in the house, the guy that left his underwear. <laughs> it's like every part. Wait, this of- is the couple that visited you and your <laughs> husband. <laughs> <laughs> every part of the film is like literally the opposite of what someone using logical thought would do. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. Because it is a case study. It is a uh, stream of consciousness. Is... <laughs> That's a very eloquent way of putting very it. Very polite, Chris. <laughs> very polite way of putting it. Uh, all right. Well, Rosie, where can people find you online? I know your podcast. Yes. Listen to my podcast, Out of the Box Podcast. I've or been you on it. Find like... me. You've been on it twice. You're one of only two guests that have been on twice, Graham. Nice. Oh, wow. um, cheep, 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 <laughs> cheep, 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 Or on Twitter, at Funny Rosie. Nice. Yeah. Um, Guys, uh, it's official. The FNX uh, stand-up show, Custer's Last Stand-Up, is going to be, we're shooting our first show December 17th out in uh, at the San Bernardino, uh, the theater on the San Bernardino Valley College campus. Uh, we've got four amazing comics, Leah Mansfield, uh, Sheila Chalaki, Jim Rule, and Mark Yaffe. It's a Native American stand-up show and world indigenous people and just also big name comedians. Um, so if you go to uh, GrahamElwood.com, you'll see the dates there. Uh, so come out December 17th. You're supporting a, a cool new channel. It's only about five or six years old, FNX, First Nation Experience. And uh, tickets are $15, $10 if you have a student ID. Uh, so come on out and support this. I'm directing it. I'm producing it. It's a big deal. Uh, you, so you'd be, be supporting, supporting me and seeing some really cool comics maybe you haven't heard of. And we're going to be doing 13 of these episodes, so please come out to one or more of them if you can. Now people can see it on PBS? Is that where? Yeah, so FNX is carried on a bunch of different PBS channels. It'll be out on the network in the spring. Um, but if you are in Southern California in the next three months, come out. Check out a show. Check out a show. Come to a live taping. You're helping. You know, you can see how TV's made. Very cool. It's really cool. So I want to mention, too, the uh, final episode of Conversations from the Abyss has dropped for uh, season one. And this is called uh, Good and Evil, about an angel and a demon who discuss the nature of good and evil in a coffee shop. And it stars uh, Cecil Baldwin from um, Welcome to Night Vale. So uh, check that out, Conversations from the Abyss. I think that's it. That's our show. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Rosie Tran. Uh, thank you for coming to PodFest. Yes. <laughs> and watching our we... show that changed your life. <laughs> um, thank you for alienating your friends. Yes. And, and All in the name of movies. All in the name of movies. I'm glad you texted me so we could have this experience. <laughs> uh, thank you to Aaron Brungard and everybody here at the ATC. My name is Graham Elwood. And I'm Chris Mancini. And as always, remember, Han, Han shot first. first. Jeep, 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 jeep. <laughs>